Most of my friends have equal parts interest and skepticism about all things spooky or mysterious. Ghosts, UFOs, legendary monsters, all sorts of things. Never believing in such things, but remaining passionately in love with the ideas and at the same time maintaining just a little bit of fear in case that fraction of a percent inside of us that hasn't written these ideas off completely may be proven correct after all. Blame it on our youth, I suppose. Our childhood was shadowed by the great satanic panic, which is a time I don't think people consider much enough these days, though doing so may be to the benefit of a social sobriety. Talk shows and even the nightly news at the time was filled with all sorts of spooky things told as if they were true. Ghostbusters was a popular movie franchise that spun off a cartoon show and action figures and introduced less literary or folklore inclined kids to such legends as the ghost of Casey Jones, the Phantom Engineer, and other such things. In the mornings before school, two episodes of In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy came on and I could only watch the first half of the second episode before I'd have to run to the elementary school which was on the next block. And of course, there was Unsolved Mysteries with the stentorian Robert Stack. The past decade saw an incredible rise in shows about ghosts. Even the Animal Planet Network had a ghost story show making sure to mention that the people being interviewed had pets so as to not completely lose the Animal Planet's target audience. This is cyclical, I suppose, as such programs were wicked popular in the 1980s as well. The now fading crop though, which in my memory was spearheaded by ghost hunters, had its own spin. More recently, cryptoid and alien shows have started to overtake the various ghost shows, their market having become saturated. The popularity of UFOs stays at about a low hum with occasional spikes in popularity. It seems to me that the 1950s and 1970s were big spikes in the general fascination with the idea of UFOs, but that was all before my time. But my older friends and my friends' parents grew up then, and I have two different stories from the same event. This is the story of the Butler County UFO. I met my friend Michael in second grade. We were pretty fast friends through middle school, and though we remained friendly, we were closer when we were young. I only occasionally speak with him. The last time was about two years ago when he was back in the country, having moved to Germany about ten years ago where he is an opera singer. Michael's job has absolutely nothing to do with this story, but it's just too interesting not to mention. Anyhow, years back, I'm in Michael's family's van, going back from... Well, going back to their farm from someplace, I think we were in Pittsburgh for something. Michael's mom is driving, and it's just Michael, myself, and his slightly younger brother, Ben, in the van. It's late at night, and we're on a country road, and we're sharing spooky stories of local haunts when Ben and Michael asked her mom to tell the story of the UFO. She told the story simply, honestly, without building it up. It didn't sound rehearsed, but it sounded like something she had told many times, like like a police statement or something like that. If there was an emotion in her voice, it was something closer to mild confusion than anything else, and the story went like this. Michael's mom had grown up somewhere in the country outside Butler, Pennsylvania, which is the seat of Butler County. A teenager in the 1970s, this occurred one late spring, early summer evening around 1974. There is a drive-in movie theater off Route 8 just north of Butler, and it's still in operation, having opened up in 1958. Michael's mom was there one evening with a few friends. I only remember specific parts of the story, and I don't know if certain details were not mentioned or have just been forgotten but a UFO, vaguely acorn-shaped, lands on the grounds of the drive-in theater, on the hillside near the tree line in the back end of the property. Was it in the middle of a movie? Was it between showings? I cannot remember or have forgotten, but she told us that there wasn't a panic 
everyone just got quiet and looked at the hillside. Someone quietly asked if it was a proper promotion for a film that was happening. There were certainly a number of UFO films in 1974, including a documentary featuring Rod Serling and Meredith Burgess. Whatever, though, the craft didn't stay too long before it lifted back up and away. And that was the story. The group which Michael's mom had gone to the drive-in with were pretty freaked out and spoke about the night for a long while, and it just kind of passed into the family lore. Clearly, I thought about that story a lot. My natural inclination is to believe that it was some sort of stunt for a movie. There are multiple screens at the drive-in in question which, with the exception of digital projectors installed a few years ago, is much the same today as it was when it first opened. The craft was said to have landed near the tree line up the hill in the back of the drive-in. I'm assuming it had lights emanating from it. Why assume it was a movie stunt? Why would a presumed alien craft land for a few minutes in a relatively rural section of western Pennsylvania just to then lift off minutes later? Could it have been an experimental military craft? I doubt it, just because there are way too many better places to do something like that. That was where my conclusions were, until years later in my 20s when I was working for a non-profit in Butler. One of my co-workers was a good 20 years older than myself. We got along and once, well I should say, she even taught me how to make pumpkin rolls. I used to help her out because she would make dozens of them for some reason or another every Christmas. But that, that has again nothing to do with the story. But we were in a car uh, quite often and one day we were heading on 422 towards Lawrence County. And we passed this small town where she had grown up. Again, this being just outside of Butler along Route 422. We had likely passed by this spot together on a number of occasions, but she pointed out her grandmother's house visible from the road, and I'd heard some of her stories before, but one day I brought up Michael's mother's story about the UFO, and my co-worker, who we'll call Becky, she knew of it. Not not of Michael's mother's perspective, but knew about a UFO thing that had happened at the drive-in. She spoke about having been playing out in the street that day. Uh, she She had been on her bike. It was early in the summer, she said, around dusk, and she saw a light in the sky and a strange craft flying low in the sky. She said it moved slowly, quietly and cut across at an angle from the road on which she was on. That was it. That was all she remembered seeing. But it obviously caused a conversation. Neither one of these stories was particularly detailed. Neither seemed to be embellished, and if they were, weren't embellished in a particularly interesting way, aside from the general topic being UFOs. The timeline and the locations the sites being maybe 10 miles from one another, obviously had me wondering if they weren't two stories concerning the same event. Did I believe it? I mean, I believe their stories. Michael's mother didn't tell it like it was some story to freak us kids out, really. Like I said, it was more akin to someone reading a press statement or a police report. Besides, it seems like it could have easily been a stunt relating to a movie. Becky, she was a bit younger, 10 or maybe 12 years old, and maybe she did see something. I I know that she was familiar with the supposed UFO sighting at the drive, and obviously when she told me the story, she said she remembered the day that it happened and having seen something shortly before dusk. Is it possible that she saw something and didn't understand it up in the sky? And over the time, the two stories converge as a means of an explanation? That doesn't sound improbable either. One of the curious things to me was how little spread the story was. In our photos on our Dr. Pennsylvania Facebook page, we've documented the Black Cross of Butler, which is off 422 also. The Black Cross of Butler is a series of mass graves from the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. 
I'd read about these graves in a dusty old book in a library, but I'd never heard anyone, including older friends whose families had been in the region for generations, talk about it. And I had started to wonder if these graves were real at all until the year 2002 when a state historical marker was established at the site. Maybe most people knew the craft at the drive-in was a gimmick, but Michael's mother and the others in her party did not. It would explain why the story wasn't as widespread as, say, the infamous Kecksburg crash near Greensburg, PA in Westmoreland County, the documents of which have recently become declassified. Or maybe like the Black Cross, it was just a thing that happened and was nearly forgotten about. I tried to find other stories, other documentation about this incident in the mid-1970s in Butler, Pennsylvania. I even went to Stan Gordon, Western Pennsylvania's well-known writer on UFOs and cryptids whose career was catalyzed by the aforementioned Kecksburg happenings. Stan's public notes contain nothing, but then I went to the National UFO Reporting Center, which catalogs sightings and even attempts to explain some, such as mistaken planets and likely meteors. I sorted through the time period and came across this one account which the author states occurred on June 15th, approximately 1974. June 15th was a Saturday night, which, you know, a popular night for the drive-in. The author was living roughly 15 minutes north of the drive-in theater. They wrote, We were kids, about 14 years old at the time. We live in a rural area. A friend and I were walking up a dirt road when we got to the top of a small hill. Three lights in a triangle lit up just above a telephone pole. I remember it made no sound and did not move. The only other thing I remember is running home. I can't remember even telling my parents. Years later, I seen my childhood friend that was with me and I asked him if he remembered that night. He did, but that was it. We never talked about it again. I wish I could remember more about that night or have a chance to see them again now that I'm older. Every time I see a program about UFOs, I think about that night. I know we're not alone. Nobody can tell me different. I can't think of a clean way to say all the following, so I'm just going to throw everything out there. I've already mentioned the Kecksburg incident. And... Kecksburg really isn't that far away from Butler. I think it's about 60 miles, maybe. And Butler shares a very small, but we do share a border of sorts with Westmoreland County. The craft at the Kecksburg incident was acorn-shaped. So, here's something that I've thought about, and it makes sense. Kecksburg was a high-profile UFO event which occurred about nine years before the Butler incident. When I heard Michael's mother tell me the story, I remember her saying that the crafts was acorn-shaped. But did I? Because the Kecksburg event happened, as I said, about a decade before the incident in Butler. Was her memory influenced by that earlier crash in the same way I postulated Becky's memories of a childhood mystery had merged with another story as a way of explaining the unknown? Or maybe I only remember Michael's mother saying it was acorn-shaped. Maybe I, as a child predisposed to reading and listening about such things, had inserted this detail. I know for certain that I was aware of the Kecksburg crash, even if I did not think of it as a local event as when I was a kid. On a side note, for as long as I can remember, I thought acorn-shaped spacecraft were stupid. I can't imagine it being practical, the Apollo command module being an exception, maybe. But acorn-shaped interstellar travel? I've always thought that was a bad design. It's my long-held opinion of this is certain, and that is one of the few things I can truly believe in. I've been to that drive-in a number of times. During the summer months, they have flea markets there on weekend mornings. And I have two memories of the flea market, and they both occurred at the same visit. First off, there was a Charles Lindbergh, Spirit of St. Louis inspired radio, and I passed it up. The guy was asking $40, and dang, I have looked at eBay this very evening, and the cheapest one I can see is for $125, and the tape deck doesn't stay closed. 
I should have swung on it then. $40? I don't usually keep regrets, but that one really nags me. More importantly though, the other memory I have of being at the flea market that day at the drive-in is walking toward the tree line behind the snack bar and looking out and remembering the story I had heard years ago while driving a dark country road in my friend's family van and wondering what exactly happened that night.